In 1933, Everest, like jet propulsion, was still unconquered. To climbers, it was a challenge that had become an obsession. For the aircraft industry, an opportunity. That year, a group of young men set out from England to attempt to fly for the first time over the world's highest mountain. The wooden crates they took with them contained two little Westland biplanes from Yeovil. Their wings from the Gloucester Aircraft Company at Brockworth, supercharged Pegasus engines borrowed from the Bristol Aeroplane Company at Filton. The cost of it all was almost totally met by Lady Houston, who two years before had backed Britain's entry in the Schneider Trophy seaplane race. They had open cockpits. Oxygen masks were almost their only concession to the height. They had no radios. Their top speed was less than 200 miles an hour. Yet they were record breakers. Four men, a Western Wapiti, and a Western PV3. From their base at Pernia in Bengal, the expedition faced a long, slow climb through mist and cloud to reach the unknown air of the Himalayas. Buffeted by mountain winds, they cleared the summit with just a hundred feet to spare. That sounds like a big machine. It's Pegasus, all right. The peak of Everest was to remain unconquered by climbers for another 20 years. They had done what no other aircraft of the day could do and flew back to their base camp and awaiting world. It was only 30 years since man had first flown an aeroplane. Bristol was already the home of the world's most successful aero engine, the Jupiter. First made in 1917, it had nine air-cooled cylinders set in a ring like the spokes of a wheel and produced 450 horsepower. Production was licensed in 18 different countries. Other more powerful Bristol radials followed, Mercury, Pegasus, Perseus. By 1939, more than half the engines in the Royal Air Force were Bristol made. Roy Fedden was born in 1885 into a well-known and well-off Bristol family. He broke the family mould by becoming an engineering apprentice. In 1907, he joined the Bristol car firm of Straker Square and launched Britain's first successful cheap motor car, the Shamrock. Later, Straker Squires did well in TT races and at Brooklands. Fedden drove them himself and went on to make aero engines. In 1920, his small engineering works was bought up by the Bristol Aeroplane Company and Fedden, at 35, became Bristol's chief engine designer. After a long and brilliant career, he died in 1973. In 1931, he was working on his first sleeve valve engine, the 600 horsepower Perseus. It was elegantly conceived, difficult to make. Fedden combined enormous energy with tyrannical single-mindedness. His design team was driven remorselessly to make Bristol engines unbeatable. He sensed sooner than most the coming of another war, and he decided to build the last ounce of performance and reliability into his radial piston engines. Memorandum to the chairman. Subject Jupiter replacement. We have now completed 10,000 hours of bench running of mercury cylinders and complete engines with 50% greater cooling fin area than the Jupiter. 
These 6.5 in-stroke engines are intended for fighters. With that in mind, the whole engine will be improved in detail, lightened and cleaned up, and fitted with the very latest cooling control and accessory systems. But other people had different ideas. Young flying officer Whittle didn't invent the jet engine, but he was one of the first to see how it could be made. And his engineering was as brilliant and meticulous as Fedden's. In 1930, Frank Whittle had taken out patents on his gas turbine design for a jet aircraft engine. In the following months, he hawked his ideas round the Air Ministry and the leading aircraft manufacturers. They all turned him down. In 1931, he went to Fedden. Flying Officer Whittle, sir. Oh, come in, Mr. Whittle. Uh, my colleagues, Mr. Owner, Mr. Whittle, Mr. Butler, you Flying you Officer Whittle. How do you do? Uh, take a seat, gentlemen. Have some coffee, will you, Jim? Well, you've gone to a lot of trouble here, Mr. Whittle. Yes, you have. This is all very interesting. I think so. My colleagues have been studying it, and Mr. Owner here has written a report. He says, Flying Officer Whittle's gas turbine proposals are entirely sound in principle and will certainly come to pass. But not for another ten years. Yes, it will be at least that. Oh? Why? There simply aren't the materials at present that can stand up to the very high temperatures and stresses that have been needed. The Air Ministry has said that. Don't you agree? I think it's right at the moment. But there's a lot of progress being made for exhaust valves, for instance. If there was a requirement for gas turbines, I'm sure it could be met quite quickly. Well, that's as may be. But our team here, Mr. Whittle, are already overworked, mainly with urgent orders for warplanes, fighters and bombers. We couldn't possibly launch into an entirely new field like this without even knowing that it's going to work. Oh, it'll work all right. It's bound to. Well, as Mr. Owner here says, a device like this operated at the sort of temperatures we can manage wouldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding. I'm sorry, Mr. Whittle. As a cadet, Whittle had dreamed and written about a jet-propelled transport aircraft which could cross the Atlantic at over 69,000 feet at 500 miles an hour. He sometimes lost hope, but in 1936, with some help from his friends, he was able to scrape together enough money to form a small private company. Here, he could put his ideas into practice. He wrote later, it was intended to be purely an experimental engine and was not intended for flight, but the design was based on a flight objective. Our compressor was of the single centrifugal type. The turbine was also a single stage unit. Our targets of performance were very ambitious and far beyond anything previously attained. Today, Whittle remembers the engine's first test. When we first tried to start it up, we certainly succeeded. I was on the controls, and we got the thing running up to 1,000 RPM, and then I opened the main fuel control, and it accelerated out of control, and so did everyone standing around. Except me, I was paralyzed with fright. It was uh, getting up to speeds of about 16,500. By the time we were getting it to this stage, it had been through so many mishaps that it was really a heap of junk. But the real turning point was when the Director of Scientific Research came uh, to Lutterworth, where we were testing the engine, and saw it run up to uh, 16,500 RPM, and he became, for the first time, completely sold. Fedden's radials were a good deal more reliable. Several times in the 1930s, they took aircraft to new world altitude records, twice with the advanced aluminium-bodied Bristol monoplane, the 138A. By 1937, it had climbed to 54,000 feet, almost twice the height of Everest. Even more important for Bristol's, in 1934, Lord Rothermere commissioned the fastest commercial aeroplane in Europe, and Bristol's built it. 50 miles an hour faster than anything in RAF service, Britain first was the forerunner of a line of famous warplanes, the Blenheim, the Beaufort, the Bowfighter. Yet in gas turbine design, Britain was by no means first.
The Germans had been making jet engines in secret since 1933. They first flew in a Heinkel a week before war broke out. Messerschmitts produced a different design, a shark-like machine, the ME-262. It was the world's first operational jet fighter. It went into service in 1944 and did great execution among the fleets of American day bombers. It was, however, according to Whittle, fatally flawed. The, uh, a very big snag with them was that if you tried to open the throttle fast, it stalled the engine. Instead of gaining power, you lost it. And uh, if that happens when you're in the air, there's no future either. It also tended to catch fire on landing with fearful results. Scores of ME-262 pilots returned safely to base, only to be burned alive in their cockpits. The British government, unaware of this, had gone to war with hardly a thought of jets and a massive dependence on Bristol engines and aircraft. In 1939, the RAF had a thousand Blenheim bombers, as well as Lysanders and Gladiators, all with Fedden engines, all highly vulnerable to German fighters. By 1941, Gloucesters were assembling Hurricanes and Westlands were building Spitfires, both powered by Rolls-Royce Merlins. The Merlin was liquid-cooled with 12 cylinders in two banks of six, the most successful aero engine of the Second World War. But the now wondrously complicated piston engine was reaching its limit. The next step had to be the jet. In 1939, the Ministry of Aircraft Production had given Gloucesters a contract to build a prototype fighter powered by Whittle's jet, capable of 380 miles an hour. The designer was the late George Carter. An aerodynamicist with little of Fedden's interest in production engineering, Carter designed a clean little monoplane with one jet engine, the Gloucester Whittle E2839, Britain's first jet aircraft. Like their German counterparts, Gloucester's test pilots had to learn how to handle a new plane and a new engine and do it alone. When chief test pilot Jerry Sayer was killed, he was succeeded by Michael Daunt, who still remembers Whittle's first visit. He was brought to the, the test pilot's office, and it so happened that the chief test pilot, Jerry Sayer, was there. So he had to put up with uh, Jack Hawthorne, another of our test pilots, and myself. Uh, Jack, unfortunately, got killed shortly afterwards. I can assure you that he sold the gas turbine engine to Jack and myself in just about 10 minutes flat. And we took him down to George Carter, where they seemed to get on like a house on fire. Oh, by the way, I put in the accumulator in to get the nose wheel up. The rest of the hydraulics we had to work by hand pump. How soon do you think we can have the W1? Ah, not in time. No. Well... But I'll send you the WX1. Now, it's only a lash-up, but you can use it for ground testing. The installation's exactly the same. DSR didn't want any uh, major marks for the flight engine. The Gloucester Whittle E2839 was completed at the beginning of April 1941. Officially named the Pioneer, it was generally known as the Squirt. Locally, there was even some talk that it sucked itself along, a sort of flying vacuum cleaner. Taxiing trials took place on Gloucester's airfield at Brockworth. Then, on May the 15th at Cranwell, where Whittle's career had begun, and with Whittle's new engine, it flew. Gary Sayer just tweaked the end of the runway, and ran it up to the maximum speed that the Ministry would permit, which was 16,500. Holding it on the brakes, let go of the brakes, and he was off in 600 yards and uh, just disappeared from sight in the clouds and uh, was flying for about 17 minutes and then came in doing quite steep gliding turns as though he'd been flying the airplane for weeks. One of my main memories of that first flight was various people's change. There had been a little sort of school of people who was trying to tell everybody what a waste of time and money 
all this uh, jet flight is, uh, we've got a war on, da 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 da. And then after Jerry had landed safely and done a damn good first flight, the number of people who came up to Frank Whittle, because I was alongside him, and said, oh, Frank, I always said it was going to be an absolute success, it was quite amazing. Well, someone slapped me on the back and said, uh, Frank, it flies. And uh, I suppose I was tense or something. And my, my comment was, well, that was what it was bloody well supposed to do, wasn't it? So it worked. Now it had to be turned into a practical fighter with the power of two engines instead of one. Operationally, George, we should like to be able to change an engine within about half an hour. Mm, well, that sounds reasonable enough. Carter set about designing the F940. The engines were to be new Whittle units, the W2B, built under license by the Rover Car Company. A few months later, a contract for 12 F940 prototypes was placed with Gloucesters and the new aircraft was christened the Meteor. It was Britain's first jet fighter, the world's first outside Germany. After taxiing tests, the engines were changed much to Whittle's disappointment, and Daunt flew the first Meteor with de Havilland engines in March 1943. As a first flight, it was interesting, but it showed up an enormous number of problems, and I had to land fairly rapidly because of these problems. Slowly and bit by bit, with quite a few hours of flying, these problems were cleared up, and the Meteor the, and the prototypes that I flew ended up as very, very pleasant machines to fly. And um, we did the diving trials on one and found out how close to the speed of sound we could get, which was quite important in those days, but that had to be done very carefully. There was no sound barrier, the aircraft was merely the wrong shape we had to find out that limiting factor. Then I like to think back on one or two of the things that were absolutely lovely in my life, and that was that occasionally a, a meteor would be needed for flight near the end of the day, and this is in 1944, and the Gloucestershire sunsets can be absolutely beautiful and nothing is nicer than taking off in one of these machines the meteor there is no vibration at all there's not very much noise because you climb throttle back and by going up to about 25,000 feet slowly you can make that sunset stand still you keep the sun just that few inches above the horizon and eventually you let it sink and then you half roll down to reality. But the jet engine was still having a difficult infancy. To provide meteors for RAF crews in training, rovers developed their own version of Whittle's engine without his approval. When Whittle protested, the government overruled him. Years later, he still felt bitter about it. The rover company, I'm afraid, uh, made a, a, a shambles of the job, and uh, their behavior was, uh, I think, absolutely disgraceful. They were out to uh, uh, get direct contracts, which they succeeded in doing. They did all sorts of dirty tricks. And after that, uh, I became much keener on getting uh, Rolls-Royce uh, into the picture. Rolls-Royce began making cars in 1903 and aeroplane engines in the First World War. In 1940, the great works at Derby was trying to meet an insatiable demand for Merlin engines. One of their best engineers, Stanley Hooker, was solving a supercharger problem that threatened to leave the Spitfire outclassed by its new German rival. Hooker once wrote, the pen is mightier than the spanner. A British mathematician, a scholarship boy from Kent who took prizes at Oxford, he joined Rolls-Royce from the Admiralty and revolutionized their work on superchargers. In August 1940, with E.W. Hives, Rolls-Royce's general manager, he visited Whittle's workshop at Lutterworth. 
Oh, God, it was terrible. It was an old, disused iron foundry. They were the rickety old floors. Old Whittle had an office rather like a rabbit hutch, you know. And it was a really terrible place. It had one test bed, as I remember. I can't remember what the workshops were like, but it was a pathetic uh, setup, really. And I can't say I was an immediate convertee to jet propulsion. I hadn't really studied it sufficiently for that. and they used to run more or less in the open in those days, uh, one always had a sensation here was tremendous power, you know. It led to Rolls-Royce taking over from Rover's production of Whittle's engines. And so we went and had dinner, and after dinner, old Hives turned to uh, Wilkes and he said, look, he said, what are you doing with this jet aero engine? He said, you're not an aero engine company. You grub about on the ground, I remember the phrase. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll give you our tank engine factory at Nottingham. You give me this jet job in, in Yorkshire. And Wilkes said, done. And as far as I know, that was all that there was to it. Within a few uh, months, we, we Rolls-Royce, were able to put 2,000 men onto the job of making Whittle's jet engine work. Through the combined efforts of Whittle, Carter and Hooker and their overworked teams, the first operational meteors were delivered to 616 Squadron in time to tackle the ramjet-powered V-1 flying bombs. It was one of the few aircraft that could catch the flying bombs at sea level because of its speed. And it used to be the custom to, to fly up close to these bombs and then get the wingtip under the bomb and turn the bomb upside down, in which case it used to crash into the sea. And that was the first blow that jet engines struck against the Germans. Whittle still believes, with many others, that they would have been ready two years earlier, but for government obstruction. In the next ten years, many more marks of meteors were to be built. Whittle's W-2B was developed as the Welland, followed by the Derwent. In 1945, a Meteor 4 with Derwent engines pushed the world speed record to over 600 miles an hour. Meteor 7s were flown by the RAF's first post-war aerobatic team. and their jets had triumphed. With the war over, Britain led the world in gas turbine know-how. We had a few short years in which to boast about it, and we did. At summer air displays, a dozen British companies celebrated peace with taxpayers' money and the new technology. Britain can make it was the slogan of the hour. New aircraft were emerging in such numbers that it seemed the whole world must buy them. Almost every new record breaker was British. The Armstrong Whitworth AW-52 had two of Stanley Hooker's new Neen engines, later to be made not just in Britain, but in Russia, the United States and China as well. At Gloucester's, George Carter faced a new challenge. To design an all-weather fighter capable of carrying the new radar and able to play its part in the Cold War by intercepting Russian bombers at close to the speed of sound. The Javelin was the world's first delta-wing fighter powered by gas turbines. Its Armstrong Siddeley engines had afterburners to give extra bursts of power, another Whittle brainchild. But the post-war jet age was demanding more than bright ideas and brilliant designers. 
Blasters had been building a thousand fighters a year. Even a cold war would need no more than a few hundred javelins. Besides, the new technology was making aeroplanes much more expensive. Carter's javelin was to be the last product of a factory which had built aircraft since the First World War. Like a lot of other old names in the industry, Gloucester's went out of business. The works of Brockworth, where 6,000 people had labored, became a trading estate. Whittle received a knighthood, 100,000 pounds, and world fame. But power jets was taken from him, and soon, like the Gloucester Aircraft Company, it disappeared. What I visualized was a single cohesive unit with power jets at the hub of it, you see. And I even thought it possible that I would be the chief engineer of the whole business since uh, we'd started it and our engines were, in my opinion, still the best. Whittle had expected the new Labour government in 1945 to nationalise the entire aircraft industry. Sir Stafford Cripps visited the works and decided instead to nationalise only power jets to give the rest of the industry the benefit of Whittle's work. The memory still rankles. We were forbidden to uh, design and make engines. And so that the, 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 the people who started the whole business were robbed of the right to design and build engines. Before it dispersed, the power jets team tackled one more challenge, the sound barrier. A thousand mile an hour aircraft had been ordered by the government during the war, the Miles M52, with Whittle's last engine. Both were nearly ready, both were about 75% complete. And then the contract was cancelled because the ministry thought that it was too dangerous to risk a pilot in a, a supersonic aeroplane. As a last throw, a rocket-fired model was launched from an RAF Mosquito out over the Atlantic. The watching radar lost it. It disappeared at over 900 miles an hour, one and a half times the speed of sound, and was never seen again. 